If you look at the House franchise, you see a series of films that started out with promise. The first one had some comedy elements to it, but also had some legit scares. Why didn't you kill me, Roger? Didn't you have the guts to do it? The second film ramped up the comedy, but had a good story at its core. I got you, Jack! The third film tried to bring in some good gore scenes, but ran afoul of the MPAA. Dreamy! <laughs> I thought you were dead. <laughs> the fourth film, on the other hand, well, that's a whole other mess that was mired in confusion, a story that makes little sense, and humor that failed to connect with its intended audience. Let's find out exactly what the fuck happened to this horror movie. The problems with House 4 began before the third movie in the franchise even came out. New World Pictures had been the distributor of the first two House films. The company ended up going bankrupt, leaving any future films in the franchise without a home. Producer Sean Cunningham reached out to United Artists, and they were happy to work together on a new film. One problem they had was that they didn't want it to be called House 3. They felt that the brand had been worn out and wanted to start fresh with a new series of films. They recommended the title The Horror Show. The Horror Show. This is just the beginning. Cunningham wasn't about to turn down a good distribution deal, so he agreed. But when the film was looking for foreign distributors, it was decided to go ahead with marketing the film as House 3, since the series had sold really well overseas. This now led to a problem. If you're gonna do another film, what do you call it? Do you say it's House 3 in the American market and House 4 overseas? To avoid causing confusion, they just decided to go with the title House 4, and that made it all really confusing. Even if you have a group of horror movie loving friends, and you ask, hey, have you ever seen House 4? The most common answer you're going to get is, wait, there was a House 3? Then you have to explain all this confusing, well, you know what, just send them this video and it will make everything much easier. Besides, if it gets too complicated, you lose your target audience. Writer Louis Abernathy was owed a movie to direct from Sean Cunningham. He was the writer on Deep Star Six and wanted to direct it. Cunningham told him that wouldn't be possible as he was directing that film. But he promised he would find a film for him to do and settled on House Four. The crew went into pre-production and settled on a story involving a haunted house, naturally. The mob looking for a place to dump toxic waste and a living pizza. As you can tell, it was gonna be a blockbuster. After pre-production was pretty far along, Sean Cunningham stuck his head into the production office and clued them into this great idea. What if they bring back William Catt and make it a direct sequel to the first film? Director Louis Abernathy didn't understand how that would be possible with the story they had set up, but said okay, figuring that it would maybe add some money to the budget and maybe bring in some theater goers who liked the first film. The problem was they had already had a script locked down and had begun to build sets. Abernathy decided he would just replace the husband character in the film and make it the character of Roger Cobb. In the film, Roger Cobb's father has passed away. He leaves Roger his crumbling old house that is located out in the middle of nowhere. Roger decides to keep the place as his dad made him promise that he would. His stepbrother Burke, on the other hand, wants to sell it for the land to a local mafia group that is looking for a place to dump some toxic waste. This was written in the late 80s, and that seems to have been a big concern back then. How else are nerdy janitors supposed to turn into the Toxic Avenger? Newman became the Toxic Avenger. The first superhero born out of nuclear waste. Roger refuses, and on his way home from arguing with Burke, the whole family ends up in a car accident. Roger's wife, Kelly, is able to drag their young daughter out of the car just before it explodes with Roger in it. He dies from his injuries at the hospital, and Kelly is now left with the house. She and her daughter, who is now wheelchair-bound, move in. Not long after, they start seeing some weird supernatural happenings in the house. Don't forget to eat your favorite pizza, man. <laughs> but nothing to cause much alarm. Well, there is a talking pizza that is very odd, but the most upsetting part of that whole scene is that the pizza delivery man sings the jingle of the store your and pizza it's actually man. quite catchy. I'm your pizza man and I'm delivering your favorite pizza pie. So catchy in fact that the characters are singing it right after as they prepare to eat some pizza and then the pizza itself starts singing it. By the way, the man who played the singing pizza is none other than Jason Voorhees himself, Kane Hodder. 
When Kelly still refuses to sell the house, the mafia group decides to try to intimidate the family into moving. Kelly consults a Native American spiritual guide who tells her that it's in fact her husband and other spirits of Native Americans who are trying to tell her she is in danger. By the end, the house ends up on fire and she has to drag her daughter to safety with the help of the spirit of Roger. <laughs> William Cat is not in the movie very much. No one seems to know how many days he worked on the film. Cat says it was two days. The director says three. His co-star, Terry Trees, says it was one. Either way, it's not enough cat. The big problem is that since he was shoehorned into the film, it makes no sense with how the first house ended. In that film, he had a wife and a young son. Sure, he could have gotten divorced since then. It happened. But now he's married with a 12-year-old daughter. Having dealt with a previous haunted house and finding his young son is never brought up or mentioned, seems like that would be a big life event you may share with someone. The insertion of William Catt into the film made it more problematic than it did appealing to house fans. Kane Hodder was also the stunt coordinator for all the house films. In this one, he got to do the flipping of the car when the family gets into the car accident. Hi, I'm Johnny Knoxville. Welcome to Jackass. He explained the big problem with the type of flip they were doing is that you never really know how the car is going to land. If it hits the ramp a certain way, it will flip and land on the back of the car causing it to flip end over end, which looks great on camera. If it hits another way, it can flip side over side, which would also look great. The one way you don't want the car to land is directly on the roof. If you watch the film, then you'll see that sure enough, it landed right on the roof. Hodder thinks he probably had a concussion after doing the stunt, as his head was pretty close to the ceiling. Luckily, no other injuries occurred. The front of the house was a facade that was placed in the middle of the desert so that it could be burned down at the end of the film. Interiors were shot in a Los Angeles home and may look familiar to horror fans. The same house was later used in the Wes Craven film, The People Under the Stairs. It would end up being the better film by a mile. Give it a watch if you haven't before. Another member of the house family that came back for the fourth film was composer Harry Manfredini. He did the music for all the films, even if some of it's just reused score bits from Friday the 13th. He claims that the voice of the singing Pete's in the film is actually him. While well, Kane Hodder claims it was him, Harry says he was in the studio when they were working on it and says he started making noises when they were going through some footage. He claims they liked it so much that they had him jump in the booth and do all the sounds of the living pizza, although he does claim that he doesn't want to argue with Kane over it. So he lets him take credit. When the film was finished, they didn't really know what to do with it. Since video stores were booming at the time, New Line convinced them to just take the movie straight to video. Producer Sean Cunningham agrees that was probably the best market for the film, as he didn't see much potential for it in theaters. Since there was no House 3 in the US, he figured it could cause a problem marketing the film for a theatrical run. Overseas, it did get a theatrical release, and the director claims that they heard it was number one at the Italian box office when it came out. He does say that he can't verify it, but had heard it from fans. Considering that most horror fans don't even know the existence of House 4, it's fair to say that it didn't exactly light video stores on fire. It fell into horror movie obscurity, only found on bootleg tables at horror conventions. That's it? <laughs> That's the only tapes you have? After its VHS run, it has yet to premiere on any format in the United States. If you are lucky and have a region-free player, you can pick up Arrow Video's House Box set, which has all the films restored in glorious Blu-ray, and it includes a fun half an hour making of documentary. The box set only came out overseas, but is worth hunting down if you're a house fan. Whether you like the house series or not, you can't deny that the franchise gave you four distinct flavors when it came to the films. Sadly, it appears that it ended on the weakest entry in the series. Even if we never get another house film, at least we'll always have our favorite pizza jingle. I'm your pizza man, I'm your pizza man. And I'm delivering your favorite pizza pie. I'm your pizza man. I'm your pizza man. And I am everybody's favorite takeout guy. You never have to worry that your pizza will be cold. Cause I keep it heated up on my engine's manifold. <laughs> so the next time you are hungry for a pizza in a pan. <laughs> don't forget to call your favorite pizza man. <laughs>